expectation at this time during our worship today is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Several years ago, there was a popular game show called Fear Factor on television. And the whole point of this show was to have a contest to see who could endure the grossest and creepiest things. And just to give an example of some of the things that they would have to endure, I have a picture here of an individual um, who was put into a glass case, had to lay down, and then dozens of slithering snakes were poured into the case with her. And so the snakes are crawling around her arms, her body, and as you can see, up against her face. And as you look at that, you probably say to yourself, how could she? Right? And maybe you even are thinking of the show's organizers, how could they? <laughs> how could they dump a box of snakes on somebody like that? But for fame or for money, people will endure all kinds of crazy things and do crazy things. But how could they, how could he? It's probably what you were asking yourself as I read the lesson for you from 2 Kings, right? You have the young boys jeering Elijah, Elisha. Elisha cursing them, and God, God sending two bears out of the woods to maul them. It's kind of a macabre story, isn't it? How could God? Might be a question that crosses the mind. And then how could Elisha go on <laughs> serving as the Lord's prophet, knowing he was going to endure more of this stuff? How could they? Well, rather than us trying to just put our own spin on things, you know, from our own minds, because we tend to get things wrong that way, I'm supporting that we go back into the context of this event and then look at what the Lord himself has to tell us clearly in the scriptures about himself and how he acts and why he acts the way he does. And so to start with the context, Elisha had just crossed the Jordan River. He was on the east side of the river because that's where he had followed Elijah. Do you remember the account of Elijah going up to heaven in a whirlwind and there was fiery horses and chariots that accompanied that? That's where Elijah, Elisha had just come from. And... Elijah's cloak was left behind, so Elisha rolls that up, takes it with him to the Jordan River, and he strikes the water of the river with it, and the water stops flowing so he can walk across on dry land. And this is a public event, mind you, right? So what does it indicate? Those who witness it and see it realize that the same power and approval of God that rested upon Elijah now rests upon Elisha. And so Elisha continues. And he comes near the town of Bethel. And a gang of boys and scholars feel that they were probably, you know, between 12 and 18 years of age, come out of the town and they start jeering at him, mocking him. And they say, get out of here, Baldy. Very literally, they're saying, go up, Baldy. Basically, what they're saying to Elisha is, you know how Elijah went up? 
and he left this world, you go too. Just get off the planet. We don't want you and the God whose word you're bringing around us. Just take it and get lost. And besides that, you're ugly too. You're bald. So they mock him. Elisha was God's messenger. They were mocking him. But when you mock the messenger, who are you really mocking? You're mocking the one who sent him. And so with that, Elisha turns, and in the Lord's name, he curses the boys. And Elisha's not doing this for his own honor, but he's doing it for the Lord's honor. They're mocking God. And the Lord sends out of the woods, two bears, to maul them. Claws and fangs, tearing them. Imagine what it was like when they went home to their parents. Huh? But this was a symptom of the times. Children frequently parrot what they've heard in their homes, right? Parents, <laughs> you've experienced this, right? Your neighbor just finished building a deck and he invites you over to, to show it to you and he's explaining everything about it and that, you know, he built it without putting footings down. He just put the, the, the support posts on, on this floating pedestal and your five-year-old standing next to you says, that's a stupid way to do it. And you turn five shades of red because your neighbor knows exactly where that five-year-old got his opinion from. You. Where did those youths get their opinion from? From their homes. This was the kind of culture in which Elisha was serving as the Lord's prophet. But now let's get back to the question, how could he? How could God do such a thing by sending two bears to maul these children, these young men? Is he cruel? Well, let's go back to Scripture and learn some things about the character of our God. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. The Lord is the maker of the universe. He is the giver of life. And he will not be mocked by his creatures, by those who he has created. He will not stand for it. And besides that, what is the wages of sin? You learned it. You know it. Say it with me. The wages of sin is death. Did they die? No, they were mauled. But God spared their lives. An act of grace. That was his way of warning them. If you want to mock me and turn against me, this is a small taste of what is to come. And his desire was to rescue them from the eternal everlasting punishment that they deserved for their sin against him and against his prophet. He desired that they would repent and then come back to this prophet for another message. But the Lord was their Savior God, forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And when we look at those youths, in our minds we think, how could they do such a thing, right? Mock God's prophet, mock God in this way. We dare not get self-righteous as we think of what they did. Is there a picture of you and there a picture of me? 
Ever been in God's house, sitting right here, wishing that a preacher would just say amen because you've got some recreation activities you'd like to get to at home or an improvement project that, that's just waiting for you? What are you really saying to God? Maybe it's not as blatant as saying, go up baldy. You're saying, God, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for this. Or you have occasions where when it comes to knowing what, what God wants you to do and, and to say, and you zip the lip because you don't want any pushback. And you're simply saying, Lord, I don't want to speak what you've given me to speak because it may hurt me. I'm more important than you are. And so who deserves to be mauled? I do. You do. And worse. But our gracious God has left us here still living and breathing, hasn't he? Just as he left those young boys living and breathing, giving them time to repent, to come to him. And so that we do not even begin to think that our Lord is cruel. Let's remember who else was torn and pierced by him. His own son, right? Thorns on his head, nails through his hands, his own soul pierced with the agony of being cut off from his father. For all the times you were disrespectful and I was disrespectful and those 42 boys were disrespectful. For them, Jesus was mauled. For us, he was crushed. Cruelty? No, love. Love for you, love for me, so that we could have full pardon in the sight of our God. And so, brothers and sisters, as we look at the history of the Old Testament, looking at this occasion, and God's people being unfaithful throughout, we have this message from Nehemiah, in his great mercy, he did not put an end to his people. In his great mercy, he has not put an end to us. And in fact, he's given us a glorious future, hasn't he? An inheritance that never will perish, spoil, or fade. That is the character of our God, the character of the God of Elisha. And so how could God not warn them and remind them, don't mock me, because it will end badly. Turn to me, and you will be saved. Love. Now that brings us to another individual who we are asking, well, why would you? Why would he? And that's Elisha. Because after the boys treated him this way, he went on back to Samaria. That was the capital city of Israel in a nation who was teaching his children to mock God. So he's not heading away from this type of mockery. He's heading into more of it. Was he glutton for punishment like the people on Fear Factor? You know, poured on me? Was he some kind of masochist, enjoyed the pain and the misery? Well, not at all. Because he realized that the God who warned these boys and would send his son for them, would also send his son for him? That he was Elisha's rescuer? And the same God who defended him by sending the bears out of the woods would defend him as he went forward as well. You and I are going to face things and are facing things like Elisha today. Right? So imagine if it came to this. If you walked outside of church after worship on a Sunday and there was a crowd of people standing with picket signs and such and they were protesting and they began shouting at you, God is dead. 
and said, faith is for the weak. And you are all bigots because you believe there are two genders and that God intends marriage to, between, to be between a man and a woman. If you walked out those doors and you ran into a crowd shouting those things at you, would you come back the next Sunday? If so, why? If not, why? We have every reason to come back. Because apart from the Lord, there is no hope, there is no salvation. Only in Christ and in Him do we have freedom from the evil that we have done and the curse that would fall on us. And the world doesn't need us to back away from that. Because like Elisha, he was a testimony to the people of his day, and you and I are God's gracious testimony to the people of our day. And the Apostle Paul had this to write as he went through the things that Elisha did and the things that we may in our own lives. He said, we were hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. The Lord our God has given us the scriptures. He has written down what happened in the past for our learning today. To teach us not to be afraid of what the people of this world can do to us. Consider how the Lord delivered Noah and his family as they were persecuted while building the ark. How he kept little baby Moses from being drowned in the Nile River. How he delivered his own son from Herod who wanted to kill him. In our lessons, how the apostles were defended by their God and set free, how Jesus was able to walk through the crowd. But you might say, but some of them died, right, Stephen? Doesn't look like God protected him, but he did. We're told that as they took Stephen out to stone him, heaven opened and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. God did protect him, didn't he? Kept him in the faith. He let him see what was awaiting him just before he died. So that he would not let go of Christ. And so you are here today to be in the word of God so that your eyes can be lifted heavenward to see what awaits you so that you do not lose hope, so that you do not let go of Jesus and you do not stop speaking of him and proclaiming his love. You have a God who cares for you, who is pierced for you, who will protect you. He protects his own. And we have this assurance from Scripture. As the psalmist says, the Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can they do to me? They can take my life here, but they can't take my life there. That's always secure for you and always secure for me. And that's why we can endure anything for the Lord's sake, isn't it? Now, on fear factor, I don't know if I'd want to lay in a glass case with a bunch of snakes crawling over me. You know, there's a prize to be won for, for contests like that. I guess it would have to be a pretty big prize. <laughs> but we have a big prize, don't we? That's already been won for us by our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Elisha saw that prize. And for that reason, he continued to serve his God and Lord throughout his entire life because he knew what was in store for him. He was confident that he had a God who protected him. And the stories like this were recorded in Scripture so that we too might learn from them, so that we might believe in the one true God and in his Christ. And that by believing, we might have life in his name. This Lord is your God. So brothers and sisters, we have every reason to be like Elisha and to boldly 
proclaim his love and his grace. Amen. Please stand. <laughs>